Okay, hi. Um, just a, a quick announcement. Uh, some first years have signed up to uh, go up to Resonance FM today. Uh, we're meant to be there at 4.30, so probably leave here about 4.10, or you can make your own way there, whatever. It's just up the road. I, I sent you the address. If there's any uh, anyone here <coughs> other than first years who uh, hasn't had the opportunity to visit Resonance FM, um, the, the purpose of this visit is just to meet um, Ed Baxter, who's the CEO, and uh, some of the people who work there. It's a very small station. There's not, not a huge amount to see, but it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, place. Uh, uh, to meet people there, see what goes on, and also find out ways that you could potentially get involved in the place. So in the past, we've had quite a lot of students go and get involved, uh, often uh, with uh, on-air engineering or other tasks. They also run events, so there's ways to get involved through that. Uh, things can lead to producing uh, your own pro radio programs, that kind of thing, uh, for the station. So. Uh, if there's anyone who is not in first year, didn't sign up on my list, then uh, you can uh, speak to me uh, at the end of this session and uh, come up with us if you if you want to. Uh, so we're, we're going to be there about 4.30. Um, so today we have uh, Kathy Hind, um, who uh, describes herself, I think, as an audiovisual artist. Um, I'll just read a bit from the, from the bio. Um, uh, her work grows from a partnership between nature and technology expressed through audiovisual installations and performances that combine sound, sculpture, image, and light. Drawing inspiration from behaviors and phenomena in the natural world, she creates generative work that evolves and is different each time it's experienced. Uh, so I saw a piece of Kathy's in a gallery in uh, Vancouver a couple of years ago, I think that show was, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very interesting new sort of new media gallery in Vancouver. Um, and that uh, uh, the piece that I saw there in a very interesting show uh, made me think that, that she'd be a good person to have and uh, give a talk. So uh, welcome, Kathy. Thanks, John. Thanks. Uh, it's been nice to be here. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I've got a bit of a cold, so excuse the coughing. Um, yeah, so that was thanks for the introduction. So my background was I actually studied visual art and music as a kind of joint degree, and I've always been really passionate about uh, working in an interdisciplinary way. So that saw me doing quite a lot of collaborations um, with artists working in different disciplines. And as my work developed, I realised that a, a key sort of interest of mine was inspiration from the natural world, but also kind of I'm really interested in open scores and kind of rule-based composition. I was interested in how those things kind of correlated to things like how birds might flock and not crash into each other. So I was always kind of drawing inspiration from the natural world, and this took me into different areas of research and sort of now I'm really focusing on um, trying to sort of collaborate with scientists and also learn, making work where I can learn more about climate change and about what's happening to the Earth systems um, due to sort of human intervention. So that's like my key area of interest. So that's why I put that title. Um, so that sounds quite grandiose, raising awareness of environmental change through audiovisual art. So it's really the most important thing to talk about. And um, so, yeah, what, what can I do? Um, there's lots of things that we can do, but actually, you know, I've spent a lot of time creating installations and working in that way. So I make work with that kind of purpose and that uh, way of immersing myself further within that and learning more. So, yeah, I want to share with you some of my installations and the processes that I went through to create them, some of the collaborative processes, and kind of how they, how they come together and how they relate to what I've been talking about. So I just sort of put up a couple of questions at the beginning um, to sort of outline what I'm aiming, what I'm trying to achieve with my work. So can making immersive audiovisual installations encourage a deeper understanding and empathetic relationship with the natural world? So yeah, I'll talk more about that as I show you my work. Um, and also, going back to what I initially t spoke about in terms of combining more than one art form, can that enhance the immersive qualities of an installation by appealing to more than one sense? Um, so those are the kind of key things I'm going to uh, sort of refer to when I show you my work. Um, so. As you know, we're in the living in the age of the Anthropocene, which is where human 
humans have impacted on the Earth so much that it has uh, sort of made a permanent um, impact on the Earth systems. Um, so, yeah, that's where we're at, and that's something that um, I refer to within my work. And this quote is also quite important to me. I've been reading some Tim Ingold, and he talks about the organism within its environment. So, as in the history of sort of human development and technology, and we've um, often, as as a species, sort of seen the Earth as a resource, as a place to, you know, mine for materials and to, to use for our development. And Tim talks about in this quote as becoming. Um, part of that environment and so to sort of perceive ourselves on a level with not not as a above is is a, is an aim um so to create an immersive experience is what i'm trying to do with my installation so a space for thought a space to reflect and to develop empathy and to connect with what i'm talking about with the installation so the first piece that i'm going to talk about um i made in 2014 and it was when actually I live in Bristol and there was a lot of flooding happening in Somerset on the Somerset levels and I wanted to try and create an immersive installation that looked at changing water levels and to sort of bring that to people's attention. Um, so that, that was kind of my aim and my um, starting point. And so the piece that I made I call Tipping Point which kind of refers to um, being on the brink of um, potential you know, environmental disaster, or also it can refer to lots of different things. So the piece is called Tipping Point to sort of draw attention to that. But within the piece, I sort of refined it to something that's very much about the balancing of water levels. Um, it's about cause and effect, and it's about equilibrium. And um, so to describe the, the installation, I collaborated with a glass blower. Um, to create kind of bespoke glass vessels. And so there's 12 glass vessels, and they're arranged in pairs. Um, and each glass vessel contains a shared body of, of water with its companion. And they're joined at the bottom with a silicon tube. So as um, I've created a mechanized system um, where as one gets lower within the pair, the water flows into it and it fills up and then vice versa. So basically there's a system that's controlled by motors that moves the glass vessels up and down and the water changes from one to the other. Um, so that's kind of how I developed a system to move water and change water levels. But um, the way that it makes sound is there's a microphone inside each glass vessel and that's actually feeding back. Um, and that feedback is then tuned by the water level so basically, it's kind of resonating like an organ pipe might resonate based on the, the space within the glass vessel, but the water is kind of tuning it. Um, there's also lighting that is audio responsive. So the louder the sound, the brighter the light. And um, I don't have them all playing at the same time. So the light draws attention to which glass vessel is actually resonating. Um, and I decided to use audio feedback because I didn't want to initiate a sound within the piece I wanted that to sort of occur through, you know, a phenomena that's happening spatially within these um, glass vessels. And also tipping point um, is actually, I keep the feedback on its tipping point. So it's balanced using um, a max patch that kind of listens in to each microphone. And it raises the gain of the microphone if it's silent and it sort of suppresses it if it gets too loud. So it's kind of completely balancing on this brink of audio feedback. And that sort of also generates other kind of sonic phenomena. And so I like to sort of think of this piece as where I've kind of created a system or a behavior or an environment where the sound occurs. I'm not sort of initiating the sound. And then within that system, I can mute or unmute any microphone. And I can also control the motors that move the glass vessels. And they're the only things that I control in the installation. And I put that on a, a kind of gen a very, very simple generative system because I don't want it to repeat. I want it to kind of be just constantly shifting and changing. So um, it's a really simple system which just basically says how many microphones are live, are the motors moving or not, and there's a probability for those things. And then the piece kind of behaves in that way um, and evolves, the, the content evolves from that. 
So this picture just shows a bit more clearly um, where the micro and the light is, and you know, gives you a bit more of an insight into the structure of the piece. And I've toured it to many different places, and of course, this particular location was a really huge, empty church in Austria, and it was incredibly resonant. So it does actually sort of slightly change the behavior of the piece. So I'll show you a video of the installation. feedback which kind of adds um, uh, which also makes the lights flicker more um, so that was tipping point and I think that piece it always happens in a you know darkened space it's quite subtle and people are because of the glass it kind of emphasizes the sort of a d the delicate nature of the installation so trying to sort of draw attention to the sort of preciousness of water as well by you by that choice of material um, so Within that, when I made that piece, I also realised um, that it could it could also be a kind of um, elaborate musical instrument that I could play with, my, you know, live. So I decided to develop a live performance with it. And so often when I show it, I will also do a live performance where, again, all I'm controlling is muting and unmuting the microphones and um, changing the motors. And I've got various controls to be able to do that. But one thing I'm quite interested in in that kind of live performance is, is that it always needs to be a dialogue with the installation, because I can't just go, oh, I want this one to be low and that one to be high. It takes a really long time for the water to pour. So, you know, there's always a kind of like evolving conversation that I'm having with the piece, and I'm sort of shaping it into a different state. Um, so there's points where I might want to get them all level, but that takes quite a lot of t attention. So I'm quite, quite interested in creating instruments that I can play that are impossible to be precise with, but you have to kind of try quite hard to coax different states out of it. And so another element that I add in when um, I do a live performance is, is I can send any one of the microphones out to a mixing desk, and then I can also put that through some simple guitar pedals that just using pitch shift and reverb, because within the different reverb and qualities of the space, that can suddenly coax a different harmonic out of the internal feedback of the tube, etc. So, so yeah, this is quite fun to play with. So I'll play you a short video of, of a performance.
So by kind of having that kind of flexibility to like uh, create um, different textures and quite a long drain base piece that's obviously edited, um, I can kind of take it to a bit of a darker place than the installation is and um, and you make it quite loud and um, that sort of focus on this water level changing is basically the stimulus for all of it is, is you know, it, it kind of slightly changes the perception of it and also it's over a kind of 20 to 30 minute period. Um, I'm going to stop at the end for questions, but I'm going to move on to a different piece, but I wonder if anyone got any questions about Tipping Point. Yes. <laughs> Well, it's basically, if I just go back a few slides to this picture. So inside each tube, there was feedback, <laughs> not that. Oh, uh, yeah, there's a microphone just at the top of each tube. And it actually, ex what I did forgot to say, actually, is there's a speaker external to the tubes. Um, and so I tried lots of different ways of doing this. And I started off with a transducer onto the glass and a hydrophone inside. And it was just really, really harsh. And so actually using a tiny little condensed mic inside the tube and a speaker outside creates this softer feedback, which also has a, a little bit more, when you kind of balance it, it, it's, it, it makes kind of like uh, an easier, more um, fading up and down kind of feedback. But they're open at the top, but interestingly and thankfully, it doesn't take in any sound from outside. It's kind of a really discrete system. But you, if you've ever experimented with putting a microphone into a really small space, then that's the you, you, you know, you, you'll get like a really extreme filtering of any other sound. So it's basically kind of using the glass tube to filter that feedback and tune it to the pitch. Anything else? Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, so basically as a process, I found it um, really engaging. And I think actually, oh, I omitted to mention that I, when I studied music, I studied like classical piano, which I still love to do, but it's a very, very different way of performing music. And I sort of started working in this sort of way and I found, the kind of combination of the art forms and also this way of stepping into an improvising method that was very different to my sort of musical training, um, it just brought about within me a sort of really intense engagement and a listening process that um, I found really useful. And so I kind of quite drawn to that process, that way of, of making music. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Anything else? Um, so I'm going to stick with water for, oh, hang on, I'm on the wrong slide now. I'm going to stick with water for a bit because this tipping point kind of led to a, another project called Submerge. And um, so tipping point as a way of sort of bringing people into thinking about these water levels was through this idea of an immersive light and sound installation where you go into a dark space and, and you get refocused and you become quiet and might spend time focusing on different things that are going on. Um, I'm also sort of, I, I, I do a lot of field recording as part of my process and practice. I don't always use the recordings to make work, but I do a lot of um, field recording and I'm really into sort of hydrophone recording. And I just find that that process gives me like space for creative thought and a different connection to the place that I'm in and a different way of focusing. So I kind of wanted to sort of share that process of listening through hydrophones. Um, and I'm kind of really interested in sort of experiential knowledge and how, you know, you can create situations where your audience or people experiencing the, the artwork or the piece or whatever you want to call it, um, might experience it through participation. So Submerge was actually, um, uh, it, it took place in Glasgow and Glasgow, I did a bit of research on the waterways in Glasgow and the streams are actually called, they're called burns in Scottish. And so there was this particular burn that ran through the city called the Molendina Burn. And when you see old pictures of Glasgow, this um, 
this was actually the main river and the main reason that people settled in that place and all sorts of mills, water mills on this, on this river. And if you sort of saw it, you'd think it was the River Clyde, but it's actually the Molendina Burn. And now the Molendina Burn is completely hidden underneath the city of Glasgow. It's underground in pipes and you, it, it's virtually invisible. So I was kind of interested in how, again, living in the age of the Anthropocene, how we sort of shift and change and develop places and through urban development, this very, uh, very reason for the settlement beginning was actually now sort of um, not visible anymore. So I wanted to sort of try and navigate the city of Glasgow following these streams with different groups of people, inviting them to join me and to make recordings of the streams. And also we did, we, I, I um, collaborated with a community scientist and we did some citizen science water quality testing um, so th the main body of this piece was actually going out and trying to follow the streams with different groups of people local to the area. And part of this was about experiencing what it's like to follow these natural waterways and to also experience the interferences and blockages um, that urban development has brought about. Um, also to sort of listen closely together to something that you can't normally hear. And, also, and so and really what that what happens when you do that with a group of people and the conversations that emerge and the observations and the different ways of perceiving a place that's familiar. So um, that, that was kind of the main body of the project with these walks. And also this was the citizen science project where you kind of do some water quality testing and you can upload it to this um, to, to a website. And basically then actually scientists do use that data to like study what's happening in the country. So I'm quite interested in, in that kind of process of engaging with science. So um, yeah, the main thing was e with these walks, but with the, with the um, recordings and with the data, we also sent the water off to a science lab to get it really tested in a lot more detail. Um, I made an, installa an interactive installation um, that this is it's quite, it's quite I haven't got any really explicit photos of how it is, but basically it's a back projection on a, a kind of plinth with a circle, an illuminate circle, so it's being projected from below. And in that circle, there's actually a thin layer of water. And the thin layer, of, and there's a very uh, sort of minimal map just of the waterways of Glasgow. And you can draw into the water with um, an interactive system with a kind of pen and as you touch the water and move it through the water, it starts to play the sounds that are from those different streams. So you can kind of like listen to Glasgow from an underwater perspective and kind of make your own soundscape from those sounds. And there was also kind of options to overlay some of the scientific data that we, that we discovered. Um, and yeah, this was just kind of like a way of um, revealing to people that these streams were there. And actually, there was quite a lot of talk. And, and with the walks, and we made a book and a website as well, there was a lot of talk about potentially some of those burns. One of them was just like running underneath a park, which seemed real shame. Um, and there was talk about opening those up. And it just generated and added to that in conversation that was already happening. So um, yeah, and also the water quality testing was really interesting to sort of reveal what different areas and what histories there was somewhere where they used to be you know, a metalworks and aluminium working place, and that had some kind of impact on the, the groundwater. So, yeah, that was one way of, sort of engaging people and looking into those kinds of histories and also um, what's happening now with the, the water running through the city. It, it was installed in a water tower, which was pretty nice and convenient, <laughs> um, which was built by Rennie McIntosh, and it was actually um, built as a fire extinguisher, um, like a whole tower with a massive, uh, I think they, I can't remember how many gallons of water, I'll get it wrong if I try and say what it is. Have I got that written down? No. Um, anyway, a lot of water at the top so that if there was any fire, then a sprinkler system would go around the building. So it's a really clever uh, water tower. So that's where it was installed. Um, anyone got any questions about Submerge? It's kind of like a bit of an add-on for, oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I live in Bristol. Yeah, I really, I'm really interested in doing it there as well. Yeah, there was a great. Did you see the TV program where they canoed under it? Yeah, definitely. And what's another question? 
Oh. That was a question about the River Froome in Bristol. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's something that I'd really like to do in a lot of cities, for sure, especially Bristol. How did the um, uh, interactive system work? Like, was it um, camera-based, and like, what software was you using to um, register the information and then engage like the playback um, of each recorded sound? Okay, that's a good question. So basically, I I, I sort of um, I learned how to do. You know, the guy that made the reactable system. It's basically using a similar system to that. So it's a projector under the table, and there's also an infrared camera lined up. So what's good about an infrared camera is that video projectors don't have any infrared light in them, uh, which means that the infrared camera doesn't see the projection. So then all you need to do is introduce an infrared light, and it will just be the only light the camera can see. And then you have to do a lot of fiddling around with mirrors and to line everything up. Um, so uh, the pen has got an infrared LED at the end of it. So it's basically a pen with an infrared light. But I had a bit of a problem in the sense that you shouldn't really look at an infrared light like this. You can't see it. It's invisible light. But it can be damaging to the eyes. So it was actually a kind of happy development because that's why I ended up putting a film of water on the surface. So basically, there's two contacts in the pen. And when it touches the water, it switches on the LED. So it only switches on when it's in the water. And it also alleviated any problems with focus. So like if you have the LED here, it would make loads of light. You only really want it when it's completely touching. So I had, that was basically the system. So an infrared mm. LED on the pen, infrared camera and um, projection. And then I, used, I worked with a Max MSP programmer and he put together the sort of tracking system. Um, and then I'm not, yeah, basically pla we placed the sounds on, a, on an image. Had sort of like hot, hot spots that trigger the sounds. Oh, the sound's playing. I hadn't, I'd forgotten I'd put that on. There we go, there's some underwater sounds from Glasgow. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheers. It's quite relaxing. <laughs> um, does anyone here do hydrophone recording? Yeah, it's good, isn't it? <laughs> um, So yeah, that was Submerge. Any more questions about Submerge? Um, yeah, I'm really in, I've, I've made like a number of sound maps actually and I'm quite interested in how, how continuing that practice where we go on walks and make sound recordings and upload them into um, online sound maps. So the next piece I'm going to talk about um, is a bit more recent. I made it a couple of years ago, well, last year I think. And uh, it's called Phase Transition and I was invited to make a piece in an empty swimming pool um, in Glasgow again. So, again, I was still reading a lot about, uh, you know, water and ice and weather. And so I'd, I got really involved in reading about um, Arctic ice melt and I kind of also consulted with a glaciologist and a climate scientist. Um, and, yeah, so basically I was interested in the site as the main primary sort of stimulus for making this piece. So a really interesting empty swimming pool, kind of a bit derelict, quite, I mean, it was, gonna, it was in the winter, it was really cold, and I wanted the audience to go actually into the pool. So this is a place where there would have been water. So you're in, in a space that you know was, you know, uh, in, intended to have water in it. Um, but also the thing about the swimming pool, as you imagine, it's incredibly reverberant. So I really wanted to play with I kind of had this desire to play with very low frequencies. So there's, I think you can just see on this picture, there's a sub at the back that I made. So um, th the core stimulus for this piece was to use very low frequencies in this empty swimming pool. Because I wanted to sort of try and generate the kind of physicality of sound. I'd had this experience where um, I was in a space and, th and it was a place where they had these really, really massive crystal singing bowls and they played them and they created a very low pitch but I found that it was possible to kind of walk in and out of the sound wave because it was such a, a large sound wave and I was kind of really fascinated with how that might work in a swimming pool or try and reference that. Um, so yeah I wanted to work with like really low frequencies but just to sort of describe 
the installation, there's, um, there's three kind of setups, and they're, they're pairs. So each pair is um, the bottom of an oil drum, and above that, there's a funnel with ice in it and then a heat lamp. And paired with that, there's um, an adapted turntable with a record on it that's changing speed. And they basically, the heat lamp goes from being off to sort of being on full. So it goes from, it goes to very, very bright red um, from, from no light. Um, and then the record player goes from virtually station, well, it goes from stationary up to, I don't know, probably only about um, 10 RPM. So they're really, really slow, and that's how I got my low frequencies, by making vinyl, um, pressing, well, having my own vinyl cut, and then changing the speed of it. So it's just got one pitch on it, but I just changed the speed of it to change the pitch. So I was creating a kind of very, very slowly changing low pitch in conjunction with this rising of heat and red light. And they kind of work in uh, different phases, Phase transition is the name used for like the changing of matter from solid to liquid to gas. Um, so this was one of the things that um, uh, was in the book about Arctic ice melt, which which correlates the sort of um, the temperature of the Earth over like thousands of years with the CO2 in the environment and uh, in the atmosphere, and it's like known that CO2 um, creates heating, and the the, the, the final sort of shooting up line on the bottom two graphs is where we're at now with our CO2 emissions, which as you can see is like more than has ever happened in the history of what we've been able to record and get from kind of ice core um, analysis, because like, you, can, you can work out how much CO2 is in the atmosphere from uh, the ice cores. So um, I was also quite interested in the fact that it was Joseph Fourier who discovered the greenhouse effect who also, you probably know, Fourier analysis. So, um, and that was in 1889. Um, and basically what happens is the CO2 comes into the Earth's atmosphere, but sorry, the solar rays come into the Earth's atmosphere, and as they're absorbed and re-emitted, they're re-emitted at a slightly lower wavelength, and that's the wavelength that gets trapped by CO2. So I was kind of really fascinated about wavelengths and the wavelengths of sound, the physicality of sound being a wave and, um, the fact that so much weather, well, weather is pressure waves and kind of controlled by pressure waves, and the fact that this change in frequency was the key thing behind what was happening with the greenhouse effect. So those are all the things I was kind of reading about um, in making this piece. So these are a few more pictures. And then I think this is a video. So the sounds that were uh, occurring was an amplified dripping sound within each oil drum. And then these low pitches on the records, um, speeding up and slowing down. So the other thing about the, the vinyl was to kind of think about the sort of delay system that happens with the CO2 that's 
building for the atmosphere and the effect that has on sort of the weather systems, there's actually a huge delay. And I sort of wanted the record to be a physical, rather than kind of using digital sound and changing it, I wanted to use a physical object. And I kind of was interested in this sound being engraved into it like a fossil and that, that the behavior of the installation was then changing the results of that fossil that was already engraved and kind of pre pre-done. Um, so has anyone got any other questions about that? Yes. Oh, microphone. So in, given that your work's kind of about like environmental issues, why did you decide to have vinyls made out of plastic? For, I mean, I'm not saying that, like, obviously the, the, the fossilized part of that process is interesting, but um, for me, it kind of seems like counterproductive. Yeah, no, I, I totally take your point. And there's a definite tension with making work about those issues. And I acknowledge that. Um, but, you know, I make work that's sculptural that I want to have an impact with. And so, you know, it's, it's a balancing act. So when I sort of started the talk, it's kind of like, well, what can I do aside from my personal behavior in my everyday life? Um, I make installations and work with sound and sculpture. Um, if I carry on doing that, I want that work to address and create conversation and about those issues. But yeah, there's a constant tension with using materials, with traveling, with, it's, yeah, it's a complex balancing act. So yeah, it's, uh, I'd say attention. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, just as well, is there any particular reason that you decided for it to be like a physical vinyl? Because um, I understand that like the, the, the digital thing's like slightly different, but, um, like aesthetically, like there's a there's a thing that that kind of conjures up that goes with it. I just wondered if you had anything to say. About yeah, um, I wanted the um, aesthetically for me the sort of oil drum dripping ice and the circle of the turning obviously kind of has a a parallel visually, um, but also you can s I, uh, you can see the record changing speed and experience the pitch changing, and I really wanted there to be a physical action happening that you could watch and hear the sound changing because I sort of I wanted to put all those ingredients in to the piece but I also want the viewer who's ever experiencing the piece to be able to kind of decode what the system is that it's not hidden so I think uh, kind of usually want whatever system I've sort of created or behavior to be explicit or not hidden so hopefully by using the vinyl and seeing it turning and the pitch changing, you can kind of also relate that to the heat lamp that's next to it that's changing colour and it's sort of experience that, um, a decode what's happening basically. Thank you. Thanks. Um, but yeah, also kind of interested in vinyl being seen as a sort of like, um, well, it isn't an obsolete medium, is it? These, you know back in fashion but like aside from that um, I think as I go into some other pieces as well and working with a glass blower and making stuff I'm kind of there's something else going on it also addresses the question you talked about material and making is that there's something about making and inventing and constructing that I sort of have a deep attachment to um, and it takes a lot of time to do those things it takes a lot more uh, of a process to make a record than to play a digital sound file. And I'm interested in human effort to sort of make things and invent things and craft things as opposed to sort of, I guess that's another tension, but it's as, as opposed to a kind of like very fast throwaway kind of consumer culture. Um, that piece doesn't really like look at that, but some later ones that I'm gonna show you kind of do where there's, there's quite a lot of care and attention and craft into many objects that takes a long time to do that I'm interested in referring to as well. A, a very mundane question. Yeah. How often does the ice need changing? Oh, about every hour and a half, yeah. This is an invigilate job. <laughs> yeah. Right, no, okay. Any Any other? Anything else? Mine's another small question. I was just wondering, the triangles on the um, vinyl, 
and then you've got the triangular shape yeah. of the the um, cone. Is that like the three states of matter, like uh, solid, liquid, gas? Well, it could be, but I mean, I wasn't actually thinking about that. I was, again, it was in a sort of design aesthetic type of thing where actually the whole thing about seeing the record turning, it makes that explicit. A triangle means you can see it turning and you can see the speed changing, whereas a circle in the middle, you can't really tell. And I, I wanted to sort of make it explicit that the speed of it was changing. Um, and that was one way, but also the sort of triangle of the funnel, that was also kind of slightly referencing an hourglass or time passing. So again, I kind of, uh, it ended up also being a bit of a design thing. And there's quite a few triangles and circles in the stands that I made. So again, it's that balancing between the idea and the content and then the visual aesthetic of it and L design. Lots of creative processes. Yeah, like sort of how they ones. sort of gel together, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I think w there's one more question up front, and then we'll, we'll move on. Um, I'm just interested in the correlation between the space you were given for it and how, and was there any other correlations apart from the water, kind of? I mean, yeah, there was the fact that the pool um, was a derelict building. Uh, well, it wasn't derelict, it was kind of not being used as a swimming pool anymore. Um, and it was kind of making use of a sort of disused space. Um, quite the, the use of sort of the oil drums and the scaffolding and the quite rough aesthetic was also influenced by the sort of slightly dilapidated state of the building. Um, yeah, so there's some other, those other reasons as well. Thanks. Anything else? I've just realized that the next piece I'm going to show you uses vinyl <laughs> again, um, which I, I don't know, it's a bit of an accidental order that this one comes up next. But again, this is, um, there's kind of a bit of a thematic thing happening. So I've just basically talked about pieces that were to do with water and ice quite a lot. And there's also a really big strand of my work that is to do with birds, birds flocking, bird migration, bird habitats, and um, drops in populations of certain birds. So I'm moving into sort of that work, but basically, yeah, I've, I've sort of chosen this piece next because um, I think probably because it does use vinyl, but basically this piece is called Twittering Machines. And I initially made it for um, a fort in Chatham as part of a kind of sound art festival. And th this, is, this is a sort of later iteration of it that I made actually this year. Um, but when I was at the fort, I was thinking about the site and I was being shown around by one of the volunteers that kind of looks after the fort. And they were quite, it was quite interesting because it was really overgrown. It was this really old Napoleonic fort and there was quite a lot of wildlife there. And then the guy that was showing me around was quite into birds as well. So we were looking at, we were sort of spotting a few birds. And then he just did the name of a robin in Morse code. And I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing because it's kind of, Almost like it was almost like kind of a sort of coded bird song message that he sort of suddenly did. So I got quite fascinated with the, um, and I'd always had this fascination with. I was reading at the time a book by David Rothenberg called Why Birds Sing, which was actually a kind of uh, a journey through histories of people kind of looking at bird song, transcribing bird song, being inspired by bird song, and thinking about you know coded messages and um, you know bird song and whether it's possible to sort of understand or kind of postulate what what is going on and what they're communicating. Um, and some of it is improvisation and music. And I was also interested in this kind of like dying language of Morse code. Um, but that ki all those kind of thoughts came together into part of this piece. And um, also I was kind of really interested in this, this um, article that I read about birds needing to modulate their song to a different pitch based on urban sound. So this fascination with how species have to adapt to environmental change and what they do to adapt. And also thinking about bandwidths of radio and of like communication methods that we use and that kind of like the noise and the sort of um, busyness of all those different kind of airways and bandwidths. So um, the main sort of body of the piece is um, our two old fashioned kind of dance set record players. And on those I've got uh, two records, and they're, well, they're both Morse code transcriptions of John Keats' Ode to a Nightingale poem. Um, so they're sort of beeping away, and then basically 
again, using Maximus P, there's a microphone listening in live. And then that's kind of translating it back into the text. Um, but as they switch on and off as well, but as other sounds sort of happen within the space, that confuses the translation process and it makes mistakes. And it's kind of a bit of a metaphor for sort of, you know, disruptions to habitats. Um, and that kind of interfering with the, the sort of clear translation of the poem. And it's also the nightingale is a bird that um, is really rare now in the UK and it used to be quite um, present in May. And the, the support that I originally made the piece for was really, really close to a, a woodland where there were still some nightingales present, but there was also a sort of planning application to sort of change that woodland. And so this was also kind of connected to that. Um, oh, this is a video of it. couple of radios in the piece that are just intermittently having some of the sounds from the installation sent to them by sort of real localised FM transmitters. And then this is a film of a bird imitator that I made of a really amazing guy in Bavaria. So again, you know, he's talking to the birds and it was kind of like a, you know, a, a collage of all those different sorts of things I was talking about. My dodgy wiring. The thing with the the vinyl on this on this piece. Um, also related a little bit to um, the fact that the nightingale was the first um, bird to ever be broadcast live on the radio. So this piece is also kind of connected with that, which I forgot to mention. Um, so there's basically a cellist in the 1920s called Beatrice Harrison, who you may, may, you may have heard of. But anyway, so she used to play the cello with nightingales in her garden. And um, so the BBC decided to broadcast that live. Um, and it was the first live animal to be broadcast on the radio. There's a little bit of um, rumour that the kind of noise and disruption of the radio uh, crew turning up with all their equipment might have scared the bird away. And there was actually a really good nightingale impersonator that sort of came and did the nightingale. But that's complete, you know, hearsay. So we don't know. So I was kind of really interested in that. And that was also very close by to Chatham Docks, which is where the fort was where I first did the piece. So it was kind of also referencing. And th those, those recordings of nightingales were actually released on 78s as records, um, which I have an archive of, um, sort of obsessively buying them off eBay. But they're quite interesting. There's a whole different range. And um, that, w that happened every year in May. They'd broadcast um, nightingales, live nightingales on the radio at a season when they would be singing. Um, as part of that installation, I also sort of did a live performance, and I was using basically the Morse code from the records, some uh, sort of broken toy piano and some bits of metal and some of the detritus and like no field recordings at all. And I was kind of trying to conjure up the impression of a flock of birds flying around the room just from bits and bobs and this Morse code. I think this might be unedited though, so I'm not going to play all of it. And some music boxes. Oh, yeah. Oh, not that bit. <laughs> Actually, I'm not going to play that. I don't like watching performances myself, so anyway. <laughs> so you have to come see it live. Um, 
So yeah, that was Twittering Machines. Has anyone got any questions about, about that piece? We're sort of going off into a slightly different tangent of strand of work. Microphone. Um, it's just a simple question, and I kind of fail to understand something. The, the actual records of the night, they are, they are, they are Morse? Yeah. They are, okay. Yeah. So they released Morse records? No, I made those you records. Made those. So you've used, but then you've, you've replicated like, the labels from the original. Yeah, oh, I okay, did. I okay. just made it look like the okay. label from yeah. the <laughs> HMV. Because <laughs> the original version I actually played, I think the original part, I played the Beatrice Harrison record mm. of Nightingales from her garden with her playing with them. Thanks. Yeah, good observation. Fake records. Um, and then the Max MSP pitch is listening to that and uh, uh, spewing out the words. Yeah, that's that basically it's trying to interpret. Yeah, it's sort of listening. It's listening in, and then it's it's trying to. I if it's completely silent in the room, it does get it right. But as soon as anything kind of clunks around or makes extraneous sounds, it gets confused. So the the Max MSP was programmed to to uh, understand Morse code, yeah. basically. Basically, yeah, it's just listening. only the words that you knew would be coming, or all no any all Morse code. Any Morse code. So the right. Max patch is just like a Morse code translator, yeah. right? Uh, but it's sort of tuned into the obviously that I'm playing it at a certain speed, so it's got kind of a threshold for dots and dashes and gaps. Um, so any other sounds. But I was also quite interested in the fact that when it makes mistakes, um, hang on, you get you get these, I mean, like, that's actually going really wrong because I'm doing this live performance within it. So when I do the live performance, the text just goes all over the place. Um, but actually, it comes up with quite a lot of vowels because they're usually quite short in Morse. But also, it kind of like reminds me a little bit of those um, phonetic translations of birdsong that people write out um, which I sort of am quite fascinated by as well. And in that sense of sort of trying to understand birds or communicate with them and things like that. Um, and the next piece is really, really recent, and I've not got that much documentation of it, but it's a piece called Chirp and Drift. And it, uh, the reason I showed you that Twittering Machines piece was because this piece sort of builds on that a little bit. Um, and I wanted to sort of take the ideas from the Twitching Machine with the Morse code and the bird song and listening to birds and how birds communicate and also just thinking more about this birds changing their song based on urban noise and habitat change and adaptation. Um, so the piece is called Chirp and Drift and the words chirp and drift are both Terminolo both terminology used to describe Morse code that's got a bit distorted. So chirp is when um, there's a change in pitch on the keying on and off of the Morse, and drift is when it just changes gradually changes frequency to a different frequency. Um, and also, I thought you know it kind of works quite well because the piece is going to relate to birds as well. So I started the piece by going out on on walks with a bird expert, a conservationist called Lawrence Rose. And I invited, um, I worked with a poet as well, and we basically invited family pairings. And this was in May, so it was like a parent and a child, or an adult and a child, to sort of come along um, for the walk. So we, in the morning, we went and observed, and we listened closely, and we sort of took little notes about what we saw and heard. And then um, went back and did a kind of writing workshop where we kind of discussed, we talked about all the things we've seen and heard and came up with like really short, abbreviated um, nest conversations between the conversations birds might have in the nest uh, and then kind of birdified the words. So we sort of created some text content and then we, um, so that was like part of the workshop series that, that we ran as part of Chirp and Drift. Um, and the, the piece that I kind of created, which is super new, um, as in last week, was premiered at Light at Lancaster. And um, they're basically these little bird-like machines, or they kind of look a little bit more like bats. But anyway, they've basically got two sort of wing-like bellows, and they play Morse code words using accordion reeds. Um, and so we start, th the piece has kind of got all the words from the workshop kind of programmed into it. 
And so it's kind of like a sort of dispersed accordion within a tree. Um, but you can also tweet, um, tweet the tree, and it will do your tweets. Um, it's kind of like a quite a family-friendly sort of piece. And I'll show you a few more pictures of it. And again, with this, I was quite interested in like creating something handcrafted out of paper. It's that like waterproof paper um, that is like an instrument that's kind of doing this sort of strange bird song. Um, I think there might be a video if I put it if I put it in. Yeah. So with the, the Twitter stimulus, I sort of asked people to sort of tweet their um, favourite bird, what birds might talk about in the nest, and if you're a bird, where would you migrate to? And then the words are turned into the Morse code, which creates the soundscape, and they're also kind of projected onto a wall nearby. And it was really nice. Like, quite a few people did actually interact with it. And then there's a, this is, I just filmed it in more daylight. It was really windy though, just to sort of get a bit of documentation of how they actually, how the machine machines look. So I'm, hop I'm hoping to sort of like do more with this piece and sort of develop the going for the walk and creating content and then that being connected to showing the piece in a public space. Questions about that piece? Seems, yep. Yeah. Oh, he's miles away. Um, does the piece rely on tweets, or is there like an underlying like dialogue that takes place regardless? Um, it has the text that we made in the workshop with oh. the children with the talking about what birds might talk about in the nests. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it does that has that kind of content within it and then the tweets kind of add to that. Although it's like it's really new, so I, d I don't know, I think I feel like it's sort of still got a bit of a journey to go on in terms of how that content develops. And what's the system which like allows that to work? So it takes the tweets, converts them into Morse code and then... That's uh, the Ma Max MSP patch, again, um. the same Max programmer, so been busy with Morse code, so yeah. Um, yeah, there's a way of, um, you know, looking for tags on Twitter, although we did moderate it, but we didn't really need to. Everyone was really polite in Lancaster. Mm. Nobody abused it at all. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it was basically getting some of the text in. And then um, I used, again, this sort of relates to a piece that I'm going to show you later, which I might have just done in the wrong order, but I've got a sort of bit of a strand of work that um, uses broken instruments. So I did a whole extensive amount of work with an accordionist using dilapidated or discarded or broken accordions. So I ended up with like a whole load of accordion reeds. So the piece kind of mm. grew from from that piece of sort of repurposing um, part, parts of the instruments and accordions. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, as, the, as the piece is now, if people aren't tweeting in, it's silent? Um, well, it's not there anymore. I mean, it's temporary. Oh so okay. whenever it's up and active and on, it will be, you know, it will be open to inputs. Right. But if, if there aren't people actively putting in 
uh, words into it, then it's not making any sound. Right? Oh, it's using the text that we made in the workshops. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay, so gotcha. it's kind yeah, of yeah, and, and the way that the the way that the that sort of machines work, they're in like they're kind of. I mean, when I first put it up, it's like the thing with making a new piece. I couldn't really experience it until I'd got there and put it in this tree that mm. I'd been, uh, you know, I'd chosen to to use and. Um, it was for a very particular context, and I think it's one of those things where the context was this sort of quite family-friendly festival, and I still wanted to kind of work with the ideas and themes that I was exploring in my practice. But I actually did, I, I invited some kids to come and experience it, and I, they all went off at the same time, and it, I really scared them. So I was like, oh my goodness, I made a piece that scares children. <laughs> it's like, ah! But anyway, it was just like this realisation that actually I needed to sort of like think quite hard about so I grouped them into sort of more harmonically sounding groups. And sort of so when a tweet comes in, and Morse code takes a really long time to do, so each letter is, takes quite a lot of work. So a whole tweet takes quite a long time to play out. Um, you know, so within those little clusters, mini ensembles, they would all play the words of the tweet to kind of together. And then it would come out fragmented onto as the text on the wall. So it's kind of interesting thinking about how to actually translate that and create it into the final form. Um, how, how much of the uh, yeah, sorry? How much of the a lot of your work involves building things? So you talk about collaborating with a, a programmer. You talk about collaborating with a glass blower. How much of the sort of uh, making of the of things like the little bellows and stuff, do you do yourself? And I mean, I, all of it, I yeah. mean, with that piece, yeah. I mean, um, unless it's a really specialist thing like the glass blowing, I, I'm really into sort of making and crafting, and I do most of the electronics myself. I, just, I don't do the software, right. so I hand that over. Uh, but I work very closely with the programmer. Thanks. Uh, um, with a piece like this, it looks like there's a lot of potential for uh, to kind of develop performances off the back of it. Yeah. Is that something that you're aware of um, when you set off on making an installation like that in terms of like um, not coming up with a final product that's like concrete in any way and leaving yourself the room to do that? Or is that just something that happens? Um, yeah, I think maybe with this piece, I was thinking there might be potential to develop it in something that could be performed with. Um, so yeah, um, I mean, with something like phase transition, I, I, I think that, you know, there isn't space for that to become a performance piece, but with this one, I think because I was playing with uh, broken instruments and accordions, I realised that I kind of created a kind of elaborate dispersed accordion within a tree. So, yeah. There's another one at the back again. Just a quick addition. Um, you know you were basically saying you moderated the tweets, obviously, because yeah. it was like a family-friendly thing. Because it was about this dialogue that takes place, kind of like unheard, that we can't really understand, do you not think it would be also interesting to let anything... Like yeah, well, the thing is, is we did... I was, I'm was. i still... Especially because it's in Morse yeah. code, it's like... But I do actually... Uh, I don't know if you can see on some of the pictures, I do oh. actually project <laughs> the text. Okay, yeah, 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 so that's... Uh, have I got a long shot? Oh no, I didn't put one in. I decided that I would project little bits of the text oh, okay. at the same time because I sort of thought, um, uh, yeah, I'm still sort of thinking about it because it's so new. I was thinking if you send a tweet, it's nice to know that what you're hearing is a bit of your tweet and to see the bits of the text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I yeah, thought there's no, that no. kind of sense that it's not just doing anything. Yeah, that, it does, is that does make a lot of sense. I but then, um, yeah, so that's why we sort of decided we needed to moderate the tweets. Because just one thing coming out yeah. projected would be bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, you wouldn't be able to tell from Morse code unless um, you're really good at it. Uh, so how are we doing for time? I'm not going to talk about that piece, but basically that is an online sound map um, to do with birdsong. But... I wanted to show you a piece um, that I made quite a while ago, which kind of kicked off quite a lot of this work to do with birds and bird migration. And it kind of, going back to the very beginning one, and this is a piece that John saw in Vancouver um, last year, two years ago. Um, 
so basically, this kind of combines quite a lot of the things that I've been talking about. One is using a derelict instrument. So I was given a broken piano, the, the keys didn't work. So I stripped it down and to the strings. And I wanted to kind of use it as a kind of instrument, but also as a kind of sculptural form. Um, and I'd recently been making piano rolls out of bird migration routes in various different ways and looking at mapping image into sound. And I, I shot this video of birds taking off and landing on telegraph lines, which looks very much like a musical score. So I wanted to combine the musical score video of the birds with the piano. Um, and the way that I decided to map that was to project the film directly onto the piano strings and put a series of um, solenoids, which are little tappers and motors, onto the strings so that it would uh, play the strings and also prepare the piano so it sounded much more percussive. And then wherever a bird moves, it, it plays the closest um, device to where it's being projected. So it's basically trying to sort of translate the movement of the birds into sound. So, yeah, that's that piece. And I also show it outdoors sometimes, which I really like doing because it kind of um, creates quite a different feeling when you're outside in, in the woods, in the weather. And it sort of um, finding a piano in the woods hanging up is quite unusual. And then but seeing birds flying around is not unusual. Um, so anyway, the, the things that kind of come together in this piece for me are this idea of an open score of setting up a system or a behavior again where wherever a bird flies visually it triggers a device so in a sense i have no control over the rhythm or the sounds that are being created all i've done is kind of create um, a framework and again that's a way that i'm quite interested in sort of, i suppose composing or creating work where rather than fixing everything a bit like tipping point I'd r I, I'm interested in creating a situation, a behaviour or a framework that then plays out and allows. It's a bit like also, you know, oops, sorry, that's OK. Um, <laughs> it's a bit like how I said at the beginning, like the, as a, when you see starlings do these mass flocking patterns in the air called murmurations, they, you know, each, each bird might have a rule where it has to stay a certain distance away from the closest seven birds or has to go in approximately the same speed and it has to avoid collisions. And just from those very simple three kind of parameters, you get these amazing patterns because as the wind changes or something shifts in one place, it then very quickly can ripple through the whole system. So in some ways, this is not necessarily doing that, but just to sort of talk a bit about how you can create complexity from very simple sort of parameters. So this has got very simple parameters, but it, it, it sort of creates, um, you know, a, a, I guess a piece of music that is based on the movement of the birds or audiovisual um, piece. Um, so yeah, and then showing it outside, initially that was quite challenging because it uses a computer and a projector and it's quite difficult getting a piano into the woods. But 
overcoming those things. Um, it's been part of various group shows where you're kind of going on walks through the woods with various ins installations, and then you kind of come across it, and that's kind of my favourite way of showing it. And the other interesting thing about this, like I said, this is the one that I showed in Vancouver, and I've showed it in lots of places, all uh, like in many different countries. But when I do it abroad, I don't take it with me. I just take uh, the devices and I ask them to find me a broken piano. It has to be a broken piano. I'm not going to take apart a working piano. So then I kind of have been, and I made this piece maybe nine years ago now. So over that time, it's been quite interesting meeting different pianos and taking them apart and recreating the piece. But because it's the simple like grid mapping where the projection um, sort of surface is and also where the devices are, it's just a simple grid. The strings of pianos are always arranged in different ways. They're never the same. Well, I'm sure there are some that are the same, but the ones that I've encountered have always been different. So then you just get a completely different piece as it's a different piano. Um, so now I have this kind of like archive of uh, various different pianos that I've, you know, created this piece from, and I'm interested in what that might generate as well, because it's, again, it's quite nice to uh, remake it and, it and it be changing each time. Um, anyone got any questions about that? Another one at the back. This is just a quick one. I was just wondering, have you ever thought about um, changing the um, the projection, which you used to like maybe like. Um, like the movement of people at like a busy junction or something to like, or like even it doesn't even have to be as kind of in 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 your face to like making a statement mm -hmm. as that just like maybe fishes un mm -hmm. underwater or something or even birds in flight with how they kind of swoon around and stuff. Actually, yeah, um, I do do that as oh well, cool. but I haven't got the video in this presentation. Uh, but I always use birds because mm -hmm. I'm kind of like the aesthetic of the, the the piano with it being prepared and the way that the motes tap, I feel is quite bird-like and it's quite tappy and it's uh, quite pecky. And also I'm kind of interested in this tension of like uh, the heaviness of a piano and the lightness of flight and the birds. Mm. So, but I have got quite an extensive archive of birds in flight and different bird videos and I do do... But with that, this is the one that I like, I think works best. So I use it for the installation, but... Um, I have done a series of them where there's more than one and they've got different bird videos on, but also I do a live performance with it where um, I actually play the piano using different videos and I can adjust the speed of the video and the sensitivity of the translation and obviously trigger them at different times. So again, it's like, um, it's like playing an instrument where you can't be precise in a similar way to tipping point. So you, you, you all I can do is change the video and the speed of it and how sensitive it is. So it's quite, again, yeah, it's quite an interesting one to improvise with. Yeah, it but sounds yeah. really cool. So, it's, again, it's just like an instrument that's played by video. Um, so, you just mentioned then about uh, your interest in the way there's a kind of lack of precision. Mm -hmm. And... You've, you've talked about the way your preferences have kind of guided a lot of the work. And I was just wondering how much trial and error is involved in these processes, and also like what kind of time frames you're working in. Because if you're, say, you're going to Vancouver for an exhibition, but would you have to go there earlier to um, figure out what piano you're going to use and, and all the preparation? Um, well, with this piece, I, you know, I just use the piano that I'm given, and I just map the piece onto it um, and then it's different but I just embrace that difference so I don't it can be any piano um, so the decisions that I've made for this piece are that it is this video and this way of mapping the sound and this this way of uh, arranging the motors and I guess those are the decisions that I've made and then the rest of it yeah I, what I do is when I prepare the piano with nuts and bolts it is everyone familiar with prepared piano it's kind of where you put nuts and bolts in between the strings and it, and it changes the sound of the strings. So yeah, when the thing that I do tweak is the preparation. 
So the devices go in a grid system, but depending on... Yeah, I always prepare it differently. So then, uh, then I'll listen to each one, and you can kind of tune it with the preparation. So, yeah, that's kind of how that dialogue works. So, so maybe not just this piece specifically, but going through the work that you showed us, there's a I'm just wondering how um, how you let your decisions guide what happens, like how much experimentation is there and how many times have you kind of thought this isn't really going to work? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it sort of varies for each one. I mean, I like to have as long as possible to make a new piece, but, I mean, it's nothing like a deadline to help you make a decision. <laughs> but, for instance, the one that I just made recently, uh, Chirp and Drift, for quite a long time, I was using, I wasn't using accordion reeds. Uh, I've been using accordion reeds for like loads of stuff for this other piece that I haven't shown you, but, um, and they were just there looking at me. Uh, but I was basically using, um, I got a whole massive array of uh, bird decoy devices that make kind of imitation bird sounds, and I was going to use those, and I was trying to find enough variety of sound within those to make it interesting. But um, it just turned out that it it was just too squeaky and it, it just didn't really work. And I was kind of, I did have this point where I was like, the whole thing that I've made doesn't work. What am I going to do, you know? Um, and then, and I was really against using the accordion reeds until I eventually put them in and had a listen to it. So yeah, it's very much, I don't know, that's not a very helpful answer, but it is like, yeah, it's being, it's being sort of, um, yeah, lots of experimentation, and I think it's always really useful to have like a work in progress early deadline to sort of have to show something. I mean, also with something like Chirp and Drift, it's like it doesn't work at all for quite a long time. Like getting something airtight and moving the bellows so that you can actually hear something and it's enough pressure and it doesn't break itself, which happens a lot, um, takes quite a long time. So I spent a lot of time working on the mechanics and the functionality of something. And then when you've actually got that working, you can then listen to it and then suddenly decide you don't like it, you know, and then change it. But it's quite a long process. But um, also with Tipping Point, that was a long process, getting the, the motorised system to work because water is quite heavy inside glass and it's also got to be absolutely foolproof system that isn't going to break or land a load of water onto electronics. So it's a kind of total dialogue between the piece you want to make, the aesthetics you want to try and use, and really, you know, the, the mechanical side of it and the building and the engineering of it. And so it is a kind of conversation with those two things. But um, what I like about in terms of crafting it myself and making it myself is that it does take quite a long time, and I always have to learn new things. But because it takes a long time, I have to spend a lot of time with the piece, like living with it and experiencing it and playing with it. And I think in combination with that, in terms of thinking about the content and reading around sort of the things that I'm looking at, I like the fact that that takes time because it's sort of almost like embedding the knowledge within the process of making, which I find really helpful. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'm just I've just got a couple more pieces to show you, um, and again this this piece. So I've sort of there's quite a few pieces that I've started making that are working in public space using light and sound, and this is another one of uh, another one that I made a couple of years ago. Um, and it's basically I, I how did this come about? Yeah, I got invited to make a piece for a town high street in Kidderminster. And again, it was for like a summer festival. And they were just in the process of um, cons a consultation process of redesigning the high street and looking at the fact that it was very 70s and very concrete and didn't really embrace the fact that it was by a river, which was completely covered up. Um, so as a kind of precursor to the changes that were going to be happening, um, I wanted to make a sort of flock of birds sort of fly down the main shopping street at night, um, and then this piece developed, and I toured it around around Scotland at the time of year when there's like lots of 
geese migrating. And so in the autumn, in October, November, there's like massive flocks of geese flying overhead. And it was just sort of also, I'd spend quite a bit of time trying to seek those bird watching opportunities out. And um, I wanted to kind of draw attention to the fact that that was happening really close by or over cities. So this piece is, um, it's rows of hundreds of origami birds made out of waterproof paper. And um, they're arranged with their wings at different angles. And I sort of um, wanted to create the impression of a bird flying overhead. And I wanted to use a kind of, yeah, stop motion animation technique, but using physical objects. So basically, they light up in turn. And as their wings are at different angles, they, they give the impression of flight. Um, you don't really get it from a photograph, so um, I'll show you a video. But the thing that, the first time I made the piece, I didn't have any sound with it. Um, it was just sort of flocks of these birds lighting up. And I, I don't think it really worked because I just felt like, even though it did work, if you knew what you were looking, you know, you knew to sort of follow it, you could see the wing flap. But um, I decided to add spatialized sound. So basically, as each flock of birds, actually, each line of birds lights up in turn, a sound will travel with it along the same row. And there's like speakers every 10 meters. So this piece kind of works on quite a big scale. And it's um, I've shown it in lots of different places, um, including woodlands and in alleyways and ha town high streets. Um, but the, the addition of the sound, because the sound moves with the piece, it completely worked as a kind of the way that people perceived it. So it was much more explicit in terms of like following it with your eyes because the sound was working with it. I was kind of quite interested in, in how that changed it. So I'll show you a, a video. The, the sound on the video is edited on because it was really noisy. I mean, it, it was difficult to record it because it goes over such a long space. So this was in Salisbury in a riverside path. Again, the, so the sounds are sort of. Um, I started off with field recordings and sounds of birds flapping, and just sort of um, felt too literal. Um, so the sounds are kind of like similar kind of sound world that I've been using in Twittering Machine, and I guess in piano migrations as well. But kind of trying to work with. Um, you know, bell sounds, piano sounds, um, these, those kinds of sounds, and also using quite a bit of tremolo and also um, phasing um, to kind of create the sensation of something that might be flapping or high up or above you. Um, but basically, the other, the other sort of um, the way that it works compositionally is because I have, have multiple rows of birds, I tried to create. Um, loads of really short sort of snippet, like motifs of sound that could go, that could all possibly go together in any order or any combination. So each row of birds will trigger a sound that pans all the way along it. It might be like 40 or 50 meters, um, and uh, but that's still only about five seconds. So I kind of created like about 30 different like five second extracts, and as these. Um, rows of birds are triggered at different times, which is not a set frequency. It's like within a bracket of so many seconds. Um, those little sound extracts can overlap in any order. So again, thinking about creating a soundscape that is changing constantly and generative, but you still kind of um, designed it in a certain way, but it's, it's not fixed. Um, so yeah, Luminous Birds has been very... It's actually on at the moment if you're in devises. Which I'm sure you're probably not going to go to devices, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it's on in the um, main sort of town high street. And one of the nice things about this piece is that people come across it by chance, and are kind of quite interested in how you put work in public space and what that does. Uh, when I showed it in Scotland, 
um, the place that I chose in Glasgow was quite a rundown part of the city. And it had that actually, of all the different places, it had the sort of the most positive response of sort of like putting something not in the usual place that you might find, you know, like cultural activities and public art and stuff like that. And it's and it's temporary as well. Um, and then we've got any questions about about luminous birds? No. Yeah, just how uh, the the sound was moving. Mm -hmm. uh, you had speakers, waterproof speakers in the trees. Yeah, the speakers um. are actually on the same. I sort of put out um, a steel cable on the flight path of the birds that attach the birds to, and the speakers are also attached to that. They're quite small and they're waterproof um, and quite light. Yeah, and so the the movement of the sound is. Uh, is the the sound is moving with the light across, so it's yeah. panning from one tree to the other as the light goes yeah. across, right? Um, well, I'm going to explain how I did that because I was it was a big conundrum because I didn't want to send like loads of sound cables down down the pathway of the birds because it was like the cabling needed to be as minimal as possible because it was above everyone's it was going to get heavy. It's also going to interfere visually with the birds, and it also needs to kind of look okay in the daytime, even though it's to be seen at night. Um, so I worked with um, a guy that does DMX lighting circuits, and he created a board that meant I could I could have a small box every s every ten meters that would then um, have sixteen DMX lighting triggers on it. Um, so we could daisy chain those and run that from the computer. And then for the sound, I actually, every 20 meters, sacrificed one bird. <laughs> well, not that sounds terrible. But anyway, so I used the DMX trigger, which is just um, a voltage pulse to, um, and I had like a small amp and an MP3, uh, an MP3 circuit that you could trigger next track. So I used the DMX trigger to trigger next track, which I then panned to two speakers. And then as it got to the next amp, it triggered next track. So then I had to like divide the sound up into one and a half second chunks that panned in the stereo, but then got triggered. So I didn't have to send any sound cables. Yes. Which, um, which was really low cost as well. And it also meant that... Um, it was really easy to troubleshoot, so you could kind of like take out um, one or you know fix one of those MP3 players, and it's yeah, always looking for low cost, low cabling solutions. Um, is there anything else to say about that? No. Except it was a nightmare because all the files had to be called the same thing, like zero 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 one, and then be tiny. But anyway. That's another thing. Anyone got any other questions about luminous birds? So it, the piano and luminous birds and various of the bird-related pieces that I show outdoors are part of a much larger show that I do with four or five other artists called For the Birds. Um, and then, and that's, oops, next slide. So that's a show that's like a two kilometer walk through a landscape uh, that has uh, 26 different installations all to do with birds. So there's the th sort of three of the pieces that I've just shown you are part of that. And there's like a lot more. And for this work, it's I guess it's quite a large team. This photograph is taken of um, a bird reserve in Wales called Innes here, which is in the Dovey Valley near Aberystwyth. And so we try and create, um, we use quite low light level. So it's kind of, there's quite a few light festivals and light shows that happen in various cities or in gardens or in parks. Um, and there can be quite a focus on the sort of large spectacular light installations. And we're trying to do something in this show that we can still get a lot of audience to, because it's quite a massive job to set up and there's quite a lot of infrastructure, so it can be quite expensive to put on. So we can actually put this show on um, when it, it was in Brighton Festival last year and we had 15,000 people come. So it means that it can make sense for festival to 
put this show on, but we want to sort of still maintain a kind of intimacy with the installations. We don't want it to be like really crowded. You want it to feel like you've come to the woods at night and you might almost be just on your own. Um, so we're trying to balance this by having quite a long walk um, and people coming in at various different intervals. And so all the installations are kind of to do with um, bird song, bird life, or bird habitat, and or bird flight. Um, and the idea is that, y you know, we're inviting people to the woods that they might go to regularly, but at night. And that's a very different experience. And I think in the darkness, you can kind of um, pull out details or attention to very sort of um, simple everyday things, like how you might light things or different parts of the landscape that are already present, but you can frame differently in the darkness with the lighting. Um, and so this, this is another picture of um, the piano installation on that, that show. Um, and again, this is in a series as a boardwalk with like miniature cuckoo bellows all being kind of triggered by tiny motors where you kind of have to weave your way along this boardwalk and kind of trust that you're going to come out the other end. Um, and again, everything, this whole piece cannot work in any weather and it's really accessible. Um, but one of the, the things that it does do is people respond in a way, well, in many different ways, but also it's, it's kind of unusual to go to the woods at night and it's giving people that opportunity and chance to sort of do that where it's um, very subtly lit. So it's still almost verging on being in the woods at night without any light um, and sort of maintaining that intimacy. But also it might be in the mist, it might be in the rain and sort of embracing that being outside in the environment with these subtle installations happening um, and kind of appreciating these specific places that we've chosen to make the work. And every time we do the show, it's different because there's different aspects of a landscape that we might want to highlight or um, bring attention to, or just sort of like, um, uh, this is a piece by Mark Anderson, which is impossible to film, but it's basically lots of LEDs that uplight these, these dead trees that are in this kind of estuary. Um, and each one kind of makes a different tapping sound. It sounds like cicadas and it moves very quickly. And it's, on the one sense, it's probably one of the more um, the loudest spe kind of I spectacle of a piece that is part of the show. Um, but still, people are experiencing it not in a massive crowd. Um, and another one, Feather Arch by Ulf Pedersen, that takes people through this slide projection through, through smoke as you're kind of walking through the woods. Um, and finally, um, another piece of Mark Anderson with spinning feathers that kind of, as they spin, they're like whirling dervishes. So we're trying to create a sense of um, wonder with these quite simple, mechanical, um, captivating, intimate installations. But the bigger picture is that it's this walk through the woods that takes like two hours for people to kind of walk through. And that sense of being outside and being immersed is the... Um, you know, what we're kind of passionate about sort of bringing as an experience. So that's all I've brought to talk to you about. I don't know if anyone's got any other questions about anything or general things. Yes. Um, so coming back to something you said at the very beginning about um, climate change and the Anthropocene um, and audience appreciation or uh, discussion through what you're showing them. And I wondered um, what your thoughts were about um, joy as opposed to shock mm. at what you're showing them. Mm -hmm. For example, with the tipping point... Mm. Um, it's quite haunting, it's quite mm -hmm. melancholy, mm -hmm. and sometimes melancholy with regards to the Anthropocene can cause like petrification yep. when folk don't do anything about it. Yep. Um, whereas coming on to some of the bird stuff, there's a lot more joy and character and mm -hmm. um, fun with some of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I wondered what your thoughts were on audience reaction and joy versus um, shock. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a really good point because it is like, 
I think one of the reasons that I'm making the work and it's about experiential and immersion is that it's, it's really hard to necessarily talk about things. It can become this sticking point where it's, yeah, petrification or like, you know, where do you go from there to try and open up a different space that might have. So actually for the birds, yeah, it's very much about a sense of wonder and joy. And we've had really amazing feedback from people saying, you know, that they'd not really thought about the woodland near their house in that way before and how valuable it is. And just that sense of um, wanting to care for these places and for the outdoors and to think about these things. So that's had a really positive response. And because of the way that we show it in these festivals like Brighton Festival or Durham Lumiere, and we, we do get a really diverse range of audience that might not necessarily go to sort of other like art gallery type things or so. To us, that's a really important part of it. Um, and it's also, yeah, so the pieces like Phase Transition and Tipping Point are much darker. Although Tipping Point, um, it's a bit haunting, but it's also, um, people find it quite meditative and will spend quite a long time in there. And again, for me, this moment of maybe spending quite a lot of time watching a water level change, what might that do as an experience to how you might think about things? And it's a really tiny thing, and it might not do anything in terms of how you appreciate things or change how you behave, because it's like um, they're really massive problems and really, really impossible things to kind of get your head around. Well, not impossible, but, you know, it's, it's huge. And so it's sort of trying to create space where there's a moment to stop or to slow down or to think in a different context where you're not faced with a whole load of, like, facts and stuff that feels overwhelming. Um, but yeah, I d you know, it's an attempt to sort of think about different ways of experiencing or uh, bringing those to the fore. Yeah, that, that's great, thanks. Okay. <laughs> oh, I well, sorry, one more question. Who, uh, which other artists are you influenced by? Oh, oh wow. Uh, Good question. Well, I mean, lots. <laughs> um, so I'm just trying to think what might come to mind at the moment. Um, I'm just trying to think of... Well, uh, it's funny. The, the, first, the first thing that comes to mind is actually something that um, I, ex I experienced quite a long time ago, which was um, the first time I experienced a kind of site-specific installation. It was like Laurie Anderson and Brian Eno had made a piece in a storage unit in Wembley. And it was, they used all, all the different rooms to create installations, and it was the first time I've sort of like been to um, a show that you sort of trusted where you walked and just opened doors. Um, and then, I don't know why I'm going back in time so far when you ask that question, but basically another one was Rebecca, I'd say Rebecca Horn and Cornelia Parker as installation artists. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I'm so stuck on that, but yeah. Uh, um, I thought one of the pieces were really, really good. Um, but I just thought it might be interesting, I don't know if you already do it, if you had some kind of supplementary material and what people could do to maybe in their everyday life um, in relation to the issues you're trying to present. Y yeah, I mean, I think, I, I sort of don't feel like... Um, that's probably a bit too, um, you can get really specific and it's like quite broad, I think, about what you can do. Um, so as I was just kind of talking about, it's kind of about bringing those things to the fore to then think about and have conversations about and to investigate. So it's also about kind of trying to bring up questions that you might go away with and try and deal with or look into further. Because I don't think... I'm in the right place in terms of my research and what I'm an expert at in sort of necessarily suggesting those solutions or answers, although there are many, um, well, many possibilities and ways of... So I think the sort of thing that I'm trying to do is it's, it's about think something that's layered or perhaps slightly ambiguous that promotes thinking about these things in a, in a new or different way through an experience. So I sort of, 
I wouldn't specifically pin it down to, from doing this piece of work, I would suggest you don't leave your tap dripping or something. Or like, you know, I mean, that's a really bad example, but not to be specific, but to try and open up an area for thought and conversation between people. Because there's many things we haven't thought of yet. Does that answer your question? Do you is that what you meant? Is yeah, yeah. No, I get what you mean. Um, I guess I just, I just think people's lives are so busy that once they've left that installation, the ideas might, or what they would do to maybe combat that in their everyday life might slip out of their mind. Yeah, no, I mean. absolutely. But it, it might do also from watching a documentary or from anything. I mean, it's just another way of sort of trying to bring those things to the fore. And I think there's been times when I've been moved or like inspired that has really affected me and I've really remembered and there might just be like one person that happens to that that might affect or, you know, so it's trying to sort of like pass on that experience that I've had or try and instill that in other people. But without necessarily being really specific about something because that, that can be too simple or too sort of, not too simple, but um, it can close it down. It can sort of be like, oh, just do this, rather than open it up to many possibilities of, of things we haven't thought of yet, I think. Um, I have one more question. Um, about the music that are created in some of the works, I have noticed it, especially in the dripping water and mm. the accordions that were hung on the uh -huh. trees. So I was wondering what is your approach to pitch and the relationship between pitch and also the linear process, the music, the actual music that mm -hmm. creates during the installation? Um, yeah, so often when something's running as an installation, I might have a system that um, it's not so linear. So for instance, with Tipping Point, I like I, as I explained, I've got these kind of conditions that it goes through, but I'll make sure that it will run through a certain range of conditions, like densities, like how many are on, and um, whether they're moving or not, um, within a certain period of time. So if you go to the installation, you'll have a range of densities or a range of sonic kind of environments that you experience. Whereas when I perform live with it, I do do that in a linear way, and I sort of like make myself a almost graphic score or some kind of like guideline, and will kind of almost compose that but leave space for improvisation. Um, so yeah, if it's an installation, it's usually got some sort of system in place that varies it often enough. And with a performance, I will think about the sort of trajectory of the shape of it. Um, and with the accordions in the trees, that's still, still formulating itself. But I guess what I did with that was group it into um, ones that I thought would work well together. I didn't want to make it so that I, I wanted to kind of try and make it so it could be dissonant and chromatic. But then for that particular showing, I decided I'd group them into quite, they're all a little bit out of tune though, but quite hot sort of harmonic kind of groupings. But it's got the potential to be sort of more dissonant. Yeah. Um, um, and what, what do you feel that you um, say with the music? Because of course, You've been, you're thinking about the objects and uh, in relation to the idea that you're dealing with. And I wonder what role the music uh, takes in this, what you're trying to say. Um, well, it's kind of all one thing, really. I'm trying to sort of like combine the sound or the music with the visual and the sculptural without kind of privileging one over the other, but they're always kind of interwoven or in dialogue with each other. Um, the aesthetics of the sound of the music is, you know, a really important part of the piece. And I think through the sound, it's almost like that's, um, that create, I, I, yeah, I, think, I think the aesthetic of the sound can sort of bring people in, um, especially in tipping point in a sort of focused way. And in phase transition with the bass notes and the dripping, I think I'm trying to use the sound and the, the, the aesthetics of the sound um, <coughs> to create the atmosphere or the, the, the sort of maybe more emotional response to the content. Um, I think the quite sort of 
visually literate in terms of like reading information from physical objects and that kind of content and sort of translating that into meaning. And I think it's probably more ambiguous what music can mean or sound can mean. Um, and I think that's an advantage when kind of trying to make work that you're, you're trying to have layers of ambiguity within. So Thanks. Okay, I think that's uh, a, a good place Gone to over. end. Thank you very much. That's Thanks. <laughs>